welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me I have a newcomer into the temple, coming to us from Golden Lasso Games, no Wonder Woman jokes, we've heard them all, please. <laughs> and the developer of the PBTA-powered space opera known as Starscape, the one and only Kimmy Hughes. How are you doing today? Or tonight, I guess I should say. Old habits, sorry. <laughs> uh, I'm doing very well, and I'm uh, very excited to be in the temple this lovely evening. So, a bit of a tradition around here is to open with the humble beginnings, in a sense. So, okay. With that in mind, I'd like you to walk me through your first introduction to role-playing games and what made it stick. <laughs> um, all right. Well, uh, I feel like you're, especially after that fantastic intro, uh, the fellow believers here in the temple will uh, enjoy this. Um, so I, I mean, I tried it in like junior high stuff. So I'm not going to count that. That didn't count. But really when I like got into TTRPGs for the first time, I was working at the Renaissance Fair. I was playing the mandolin and I was singing dirty songs on the NC-17 stage, many of which I was I had written. And uh, in between shows, there was like three bands who all played on the same stage at the Southern California Renaissance Fair. In between shows, we'd sit backstage and hang out and just shoot the shit. And uh, a bunch of people were talking about role-playing games. And I was an MMO player. I did a lot of role-playing, but I did it in like Ultima Online. Um, World of Warcraft wasn't a thing then. But, like, eventually that became another thing that I did. And and so I, it was interesting to talk to them because they didn't do online role-playing games. I That's all I did. So, like, it was this interesting conversation we'd had. And, and eventually uh, they invited me to uh, campaign some of them. And uh, they were going to try out this new, the, the new edition, fourth edition. It was going to be amazing. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and the rest kind of became history. Eventually we started our own uh, podcast because we were musicians. We're like, hey, we have a recording studio. Why don't we talk about this and see if other people want to listen to it? And it was like 2009. So we had to explain to each other what a podcast was first because I didn't know, most of us didn't know what a podcast was. And uh, yeah, we started a, a, a network of podcasts. We do streams and stuff now. Obviously at the time we didn't because nobody streamed anything in 2009. And eventually I got the bug to start designing my own stuff and do that all the time now. Yeah. I seem to have a habit of attracting performers and, th and theater brats of one form or another. <laughs> in I feel like it's like the hobby has a lot of that. Like, I don't know. I don't know um, why. Why Being theatrical and role-playing, what? <laughs> well, I I never performed at the Ren Fair, but I, but I was a freak. I was very frequent there. I've got some old goblets from this, an from this anniversary thing um, way back, way back in the day, with the Minnesota Renaissance Festival, um, mm -hmm. the there was there's also I also prefer it to the state to the state fair because I can get away with more stuff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, though when when you when you mentioned playing dirty songs, I immediately thought of the infamous "World's Dirtiest Song" by Bird and McDonald. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I mean, a little bit more double entendre than that, but definitely, I mean... <laughs> if you've heard that song, that is nothing but double entendres for about three minutes. Yes, 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 but like, uh, some of the, yeah, I mean, not not that many of them at a time, generally. You generally, for the songs we sing, it's like you pick a single double entendre and kind of like stick with the theme. Mm -hmm. uh, so when you're singing, has anybody seen my cock, like... We're looking for a rooster, obviously, but I mean, who knows? Yeah, like, I was I was already trained on that one thanks to a little movie called Porky's. <laughs> <laughs> Which, depending on depending on who you ask, I'm t I would be way too young to know that. But then again, but then again, I'm way too young to know half the things I've <laughs> known. But <laughs> given now, given that star, given that Starscape is very much is very much in the tradition of space opera. Mm -hmm. There's a couple of questions I have on, on its origins. I suppose the first one was, what was your first introduction to 
powered by the apocalypse as a system? Um, I can't remember which campaign. I think it was Masks. My friend ran a, a, a campaign of the beta of Masks before it came out. Um, and that was like back when games were kickstarted, but it wasn't quite as common a thing. Um, so they had backed it and gotten early access to the beta. And I think that was the first time I'd played something like that. I eventually, about that same time, my fr another friend of mine started designing theirs. Um, so they, my friend Jason Mills designed a game called Demigods, which is a Powered by the Apocalypse game. Yeah, um, and from there, my library. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, and uh, so they, they're kind of the ones who like introduced me to Powered by the Apocalypse games. And I've just really loved uh, how they can take on uh, different le just like genres really well like they just I, I love how you can pick a playbook and have your character it probably because it speaks to the theater kid in me mm -hmm. and like it gives you it, it just sets up your arc so well um, so I just really love that particular piece about it yeah I can I can I can certainly get that and the other the other aspect is what well, well well, you refer to it as as sci-fi. If I'm be, if I'm being honest, the traditions that are in, that are presented in Starscape are very much in the in the direction of space operas. And I'm curious what I'm curious what your introduction to that genre was. Ooh, space opera specifically. Yeah. Ah, uh, that I think I was too young to like have like true memory when I first got introduced to that uh let's see I, I remember like my mom when I was a little kid like waited till I was finally like old enough I don't know how she determined that but there was like a day where she was finally like okay you're old enough to watch Star Wars and this was back in the dark ages when there were only three movies uh I mean some people still think there are three movies I might be one of them but uh she like we had like the big cassette tapes like the vhs tape sets so literally we sat down as a and it was like a family event we invited people over who all wanted to watch me watch it for the first time and we just had a whole day where we just sat and watched all three movies back to back of the original trilogy um so like start like sci-fi and space opera and stuff has always been something that's been in my life and my household's life and my parents were both really into it. So it was just, I don't know. I, I honestly can't tell you. I have i have memories of all these things from from when I was a little kid. So. Uh, so I can't, I can't, I can't, um, I can't judge too much given that my introduction to Star Wars was oddly enough through the, C, through the um, CCG back in the day. Oh, okay. Uh, and that, because it was it was in that in between period of the special of the special editions bef <laughs> before um, episode one would come would would come along, and oh yeah, my relationship with Star Wars and, and similar properties has always been intertwined with either tabletop or video gaming in one form or another. Um, Interesting. I, I I'm just basing my this. Uh, I'm a bit older than you, <laughs> uh, based on your comments right then and i just remember yeah like when they did the remastered versions and then all of that like it's, yeah it's just a very interesting experience to have that be so much late like not so much but like later and by then i was playing like video games were a massive part of my life and things like that so it's interesting to think about like kind of the distilled experience of like watching these vhs tapes as a kid with no access because the internet wasn't a thing and like i mean somebody had the internet but people didn't have the internet then and it was just like this experience that was like just like siloed and like this pure I, thing that <laughs> i got really started with the with the internet with during the aol days and i treated yep. it as a skip as one giant scavenger hunt and well that hasn't changed <laughs> since but right. like with with um start Whenever it comes with Star Trek, whenever it comes to the Kirk v. Picard debate, I'm always the one weirdo in the room who says, "What are you talking about? The answer is Cisco." Oh no, hundred <laughs> percent. Oh um, yeah, no, absolutely. Cisco actually had to deal with like, like, like real problems. Like 
things you had to like existential things like the hardest job ever and also just did the best job the reason why i have a fondness for for um, cisco is of of the of the captains slash commanders slash whatnot um he is extremely flawed and knows it Mm -hmm. Um, i mean they're the there's a reason why there's been multiple memes made out of made out of his um, temper issues whenever, because he does not handle failure well. Mm-hmm. Um, there's and of course there's also the fact that he never had to deal with Q because the one time Q showed up he punched him in the face. Right. Yeah. Well, and there's just like there's a whole another la- layer there of t- of like. Like, like, even though he's in from a utopian future, being, uh, you know, a person of color and the history that's still, like, tied to that, even though they're past it, having been through all that awful stuff at the Borg, having a child, like, all these things give him layers that Picard and... I know Kirk technically had a kid and all that stuff, and there's, like, a bunch of lore about that, but, uh, like, having his son there on his his station with him like changes the experience and changes how you react to things it's just like so such depth there i love i love great captain of, favorite captain um there's an anal- there's an analogy i use because the the one series that i wasn't as fond of that a lot of people defended was um voyager mm-hmm. and i remember i remember strongly disagreeing when mulgrew had said that people couldn't handle a female captain um mm-hmm. I had said no. The problem the problem was that was that was all she was written as. Whereas somebody like Cisco was not written to be the captain of color. Mm-hmm. Uh, he's, you know, he, his love of baseball, him being the son of a Creole chef, him being a very very competitive individual. All, all of that are factors that are that are laid bare. It yeah. certainly it certainly helps that well. DS9 had better writers, if I'm being honest. Yeah. Because <laughs> the guy who the guy who was the showrunner, Ronald D. Moore, would later go on to do Battlestar Galactica. Yeah. And in some ways, he wrote that as a kind of response to some frustrations he had working on Trek. Mm-hmm. Uh, namely, that Voyager he, specifically, right? Uh, I don't know if he never said it. He never specifically called out Voyager, but he expressed mm-hmm. frustration that he felt that every Trek season had had to had had to have the guy in the chair looking at a screen. Is how mm-hmm. he just, is how he said it. He did. It didn't seem like he was calling out Voyager specifically, but even mm-hmm. if you look back at DS Nine, you can see him like scra- scratching at the at some of the mandates that yeah. were insisted on him and the um, show bible yeah i think uh it's too bad because like i i janeway has some amazing potential and i feel like voyager has some of the best writing of any of the treks but it also has the worst writing like it is the most inconsistent it is when the highs are high they're amazing when the lows are low they are just terrible so it's just it, it it's it fluctuates the most and it it, yeah. it gets really bad, which is too bad because like the first couple episodes, I I love and they're some of my favorite of any Trek episodes specifically when Balana Torres and Janeway through like like girl power science like like that meant something to me the first time I saw that like it was still a point where like women it, like having a woman captain was a big deal and then watching these two brilliant women use science to solve this problem and get excited and support each other about it was amazing. Like I remember like, like tearing up a little bit and I wasn't even quite sure why I was still pretty young. And I was like, there were two, yeah. there were then, and the, you had the, you had those moments and then you have <sighs> Neelix. Right, right. I don't or like the, Yeah, no, yeah, <laughs> super annoying. And then, like, the whole thing where, like, oh, Janeway's lonely. She can't have, you know, get with anybody on the crew. It's like, s- since when? Like, because she's a, like, suddenly there was, like, a different set of rules. Like, the other captains, like, I don't know, like, there we can't, two, we had the whole, There were two yeah. things that were wrong. A point of frust- that were a point of frustration. One of them mm-hmm. is, I really, do- I really don't care. 
Voyager and Enterprise had some of the worst bits of um, Techno Babble. Yeah. And I've, I've always found Techno Babble irksome. But there was also the fact that they that um they constantly wanted to have the magic reset button so much despite trying to do the story of a lost ship. Yeah. With with a crew that ha- that half of them can't stand the other half, but not yeah. being willing to commit to that. Yeah, it was such a great setup and it just they uh, like hand waved it and they resolved that too quickly. Yeah. But then, of, then of course, I see some of the other touchstones you brought up, like B five, like Battlestar Galactica, and like um, Farscape and Firefly. There's, there's, de- there's definitely a wide variety in that, and I do see the found family theme with some of the ones that you brought up, and that's also why I brought up DS nine in mm-hmm. this regard, because while there isn't necessarily a found family in that sense. Because, well, it's a space station, it's going to be too big. <laughs> but there, it, but there, it, because of the fact that it's a stationary spot, there is time for those relationships to um, develop. I suppose one of the biggest ones is just to use DS9 as an, as an example again the adversarial relationship between Quark and Odo. Mm hmm. Um, the two that the two of them being complete opposites from each other, but developing a semblance of respect for each other. Yeah, um, or I mean, we yeah. <laughs> you can't say there, there's doing just so many finger quotes, <laughs> but yeah. And in in that same in that same vein, I've spoken many times about my love for um, Firefly, mm-hmm. um, especially since. I've mentioned in the past that Firefly is one of the better men of faith in fiction in the form of book. Mm-hmm. Uh, I mean, it's it's not it's not outright stated what denomination he he is, but he's very much a he's very much a priest mm-hmm. in terms of in terms of his attitude. But he's but he's not a he's not a wear the cross on his sleeve kind of way. In fact, he in fact he's made several jokes at that at that kind of thinking. Mm-hmm. Even in the first episode, there was that whole thing of, I was just here to bring you dinner. Uh, if you prefer a lecture, I can give you one of those. You know, Sin, yeah. Hellfire, one of them has lepers. <laughs> ah. Yeah, and there's the, the great one where River's, like, correcting the Bible. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah. But... The... Th- but with, the, with that kind of thing uh, in mind, give... Science fiction is an is an interesting beast where it's almost a where it's almost like a series of questions and the, the mm-hmm. answers to those questions lead to um, more questions. When it comes to the type of sci- science fiction that you're going for, would it be fair to say it's one of that it leans more into the exploring the unknown style of space opera? Well, part of Starscape is you actually get to design that. The first part of the game is actually you deciding kind of what flavor of sci-fi you want to do, what your goals as a crew are. You get to pick what type of crew you are. Mm-hmm. So you decide whether you are um, uh, like trained crew members from like a large organization um, or you're independent operators. So you work for yourselves and just kind of find jobs as you can, or your fortune's fools, where you were thrown together by fate or chance and are just trying to make the best of it. Mm-hmm. Um, kind of shorthand for basically, do you want to play Star Trek? Do you want to play Firefly? Or do you want to play Farscape? Or like, mm-hmm. and, and then most most uh, episodic sci-fi fall into one of those categories. Um, and some of them are a little bit of a mix of both. But that choice there kind of then determines what is our goal going to be? So if you're, you know, uh, you might be trained explorers, um, that's what you're going to worry about. If you do the independent operators, you're going to be working jobs. Like you're going to be looking for money. You're going to be like, hey, okay, we've got to get to here. Or maybe, you know, maybe you end up with a River Tam in your group or whatever it is. Or, you know, the uh, whatever your, your kind of an homage to that is. Mm-hmm. And you're trying to get them home or whatever it is. And then also like the Fortune's Fools. Maybe you're being chased down by somebody for whatever reason. You're maybe your bounty hunters all working together to try and hunt, you know, hunt someone else instead of being hunted yourselves. Uh, so there's lots of different options for 
what the group can be working on in the game. The core of the game is their relation, the, the relationships of the crew with one another and the trust that they have in each other. Um, so what happened is I was, uh, uh, I had a baby the first month of COVID lockdown. Um, so, uh, that was scary and, you know, everyone else is being admitted to the hospital for, uh, quarantine and such things. And I was going to labor and delivery. Um, and I ended up like, like, it was just really scary. And I needed, I came home and I had a baby and even with it, like anytime you have a baby, you pretty much don't go anywhere for a while. Cause you know, baby, and you're trying to sleep when you can. Mm-hmm. And so it was like this emotional time and like a scary time. And we were so, it felt so isolating. Everyone was isolated, but I had always like, when you, when you plan to have a baby, like you plan for people to come meet your baby and nobody could come meet my baby. And so it was even more emotional and isolating. Cause you kind of like imagine that for most of, at least your pregnancy, if not like your life, if you, you know, I've always wanted to be a parent and um so that was really hard so i ended up watching uh uh next generation again and at the time i kind of was like oh this is just you know a binge everyone's binging things ha 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 netflix uh covid and like looking back on it like i i watched all of like literally so like hours a day like hours and hours a day i'd sit with my baby it's uh, all, all, almost all the video of my brand new baby has like angry Klingons in the background yelling at each other. Uh, so uh, it's pretty funny actually. Now, wait, angry uh, Klingons isn't that kind of redundant? Yeah, it is a hundred percent. But sometimes they sound stern, but not angry. And then they're angry, just like cross jumps all, and you're like, oh, okay, sorry. And like, there's my little baby. Like, Coo. Uh, <laughs> but uh, so I, I just I needed to see that kind of like hopeful vision of humanity i think uh, i don't think i i didn't think about it that much at the time it's just like oh i haven't watched this in a while this will be lots of hours of watching things and then i rolled right into like through the rest of the treks after that and then it was you know in there that i started going like oh i should make this game and it wasn't until much later like i'd started i and rewatched everything i rewatched uh firefly farscape uh babylon 5 Battlestar Galactica is like, I mean, we had literally, like, like we had so long <laughs> and uh, so many hours of TV and somewhere in there, Starscape was born. And it wasn't until like a year later that I suddenly was like, oh, I designed a game about the experience of being isolated on a ship with people and the relationships that build in that, in that situation where you have to trust them. Mm-hmm. Uh that was very much informed by my fear and experience and thoughts and feelings at that time, even though I didn't quite realize it. I don't know if that was yeah. way oversharing, but <laughs> I, can, I can certainly get that. And you talk about me having an interesting story. All, all that I did during lockdown was just, was just get back in shape and loot and lose like six inches. <laughs> Amazing. Yeah. I ended up, I ended up, go, I ended up going under two, under 200. That's so not, under, not under two hundred, under three hundred. What am I saying? I'm thinking in, uh, I'm thinking in um, kilograms. Um, oh yeah, yeah. And I see. I did the opposite because I had been a power lifter even through most of my pregnancy. I'd like still been been weightlifting and modifying it, obviously to be safe. But I that was something I just completely lost, and just, you know, it's just so interesting how it changed us. Yeah. Um, but it, there was very much a through line there of watching all these shows back to back, and. No matter who it was, like they they would fight the Borg or the Cylons or the Reavers or whatever. The most interesting parts of the story and the only reason we cared about them fighting these things were because we started caring about the characters and their relationships to each other are why we started caring about them. Hmm. So there was just like a very common thing and watching them sometimes having almost identical storylines between an episode of Star Trek and then an episode of Battlestar Galactica, even though they were so such different flavors Mm -hmm. because it was about the relationships it was about oh are they gonna pull together are they gonna be able to trust that one character or are they gonna be betrayed by that character and you're like oh okay are you talking about you know uh gaius in battlestar galactica or are you talking about jane in firefly and you're like yes like Mm -hmm. because all these things they have these similar archetypes and these similar stories that play out with just variations based on what property it is now, you had set you had set up a a series of touchstones when it comes to the player sheets. When it comes mm-hmm. to the ship sheets, um, 
and I'm, it's possible that I it's possible that I may have blinked and, and missed it, but I I didn't see anything like that for the ships. So I'd like to play a little bit of word association. Okay. Um, I'm gonna give you the name of of the of each of the ship sheets, and you can tell mm -hmm. me which ships come to mind from what from either from the inspirations or just what you were trying to go for with those particular ships, if you don't mind. Sure. Yeah. So first one is the flagship. I mean, this one's like, this is the Enterprise, this is Voyager, this is, you know, those types of ships. Like, the the fancy, top-of-the-line, like, Star Trek ones, generally, or what I first pictured. All right. The now, I've had them flavored all different ways, too. Mm -hmm. I just do, I want to be super clear about that. But this is, these are the ones when I was first, like, splitting the types of ships up into these base categories. Um, that's what, that's what I was thinking of. Yeah. Um, the Behemoth. For that one, it was more like Battlestar Galactica, and then also, um, like, like there was a kind of a combo there of things like um, Babylon Five, where it's like a full station. Mm -hmm. um, originally, now because of the the Kickstarter doing so well, we did unlock eventually the the Kickstarter backers are going to get the actual space station book too. Mm -hmm. um, but that was kind of the thought with that one is it could kind of double as two of those things. Right, I could, I could, I could get that. Um, the Light Freighter. That one's fine. That's Serenity. <laughs> yeah. That was easy. <laughs> I suppose I could also throw in the... I know some would argue this is cheating, but I don't I don't think it is. I could also throw in the Bebop. Yeah, oh, absolutely, yeah. Cowboy Bebop, I've played, like, like variations on Cowboy Bebop in there, too. Absolutely. That's, that's kind of what it is, like, the all-purpose, like, small enough for a few people to live comfortably together. Like, the, the flying house that you have jobs on. It, yeah. And the Bebop was intended to be a fishing ship. Yeah, exactly. Oh. Those are some of the most fun games when people pick something that is, like, it was intended to be something else. Um, that's the other reason I had the the Behemoth, because I've had a couple games where people, like, like had, like, old cruise ships. Like, they imagined these giant cruise ships. A lot of them are, I don't remember the name of it, but from um, The Fifth Element. That giant mm -hmm. cruise ship that they have a whole bunch of the oh, yeah. the story uh, on. Lost in Paradise. Yeah, that's what it is. A lot of people like tie that in there too. And <laughs> good, good, lo good lord, was the Fifth Element a trip? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, the the next one on the list, of course, is the throwback. That one's uh, usually like tall ships. So like uh, Treasure Planet is the one I look at a lot for that. Um, there's also um, in uh, I think it's I think it's DS9 where they have those old sailing ships like the, the, runabouts. the yeah the runabouts I love those and the idea of these cool like solar sail futuristic ships that they have that are actually like museum pieces to them I just loved those. Um, I can I can I can certainly get that. Um, I. The next one is the living being, but I think I've, I think I already have that one pegged. That's um, that's far. Yeah, that's Moya. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Although um, the what I will, what I will always find funny about Farscape is it was an attempt by the Jim Henson Company to show that they could do more than the Muppets. Mm -hmm. And I remember Crichton's actor saying that he that one of the early times he caught hell from the higher ups was when he got a little too physical with one of the puppets, mm -hmm. saying that the puppet was bi was getting paid more than he was. <laughs> uh, I mean, yeah. <laughs> but I could I mean the the concept of the of the living ship is go is I look at that as as kind of a successor to the old concept of like ghost ships. Mm -hmm. You know, where where how a lot how alive the ship is, especially given how we get how we give how we um we ass uh, we assign a she to a lot to even modern ships and mm -hmm. all of these superstitions involving just being uh, just being on or operating a ship. Mm -hmm. Now the bit I ended up fi I ended up finding out not too long ago that the whole champagne bottle thing is taken so seriously that yes that some some champagne companies will make will specifically make bottles that have thinner glass just so it's easier to break. Yeah, they take it, it incredibly seriously. Or have it made out of sugar glass. It's... Have you ever heard the expression, there are no atheists in foxholes? 
I haven't, but that makes sense. I'd say there's even less on ships and even less at the gaming table because everybody is superstitious about touching other people's dice. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or in some I've cases, done, yeah. We all know that one guy or girl who is cursed when it comes mm -hmm. to their dice rolls. Mm -hmm. Or blessed. Yeah, or or blessed. I've 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 had that one person who I swear to God they have a they have a fourteen carat lucky horseshoe stuck up where the sun don't shine. <laughs> uh, of course, in other in other cases, there's that one person who, anytime something important is happening, they always find a way way to make the worst rolls, and no one knows why. Yeah. Uh, and of course, me beat me being the monk, I'm always asked to bless their dice. <laughs> Well, maybe maybe you're the problem then. That obviously, it's not my fault <laughs> that monks pull, have pulled double duty as priests. That's true. But the given now, given that given that one of the tricky things that can happen when it comes to utilizing ships is, especially when you've got one ship, is if if there is a moment where some something like ship combat is a thing. How do you make it so that it's something that the whole table can get involved in in some form? Um, I came up with a mechanic that's kind of a combination of a couple things. Um, of uh, um, uh, th There's a game called Beam Saber that is about like fighting mechs. Mm -hmm. um, and they have uh, a, a mechanic that I kind of borrowed from and also skill challenges from 4th edition, which are one of the things I loved about that edition of D&D. Um, where it's like, okay, the group together decides there's shit, there's five ship moves that you can choose to do. You can choose to fight. You can choose to like fly and maneuver. You can try and trick them. You can try and like talk to them like the captains do in Star Trek and logic them or, you know, plead with them or whatever. Um, and then you can try and like repair the ship. So there's five different moves. The crew together decides which one they want to do as a group. Mm -hmm. Um, each one of those moves is tied to a stat so as a group, they all narrate, okay, I'm going to do this to help, I'm going to do this to help, I'm going to do this to help, and everybody rolls that particular stat. In a crew, so there's going to be people who are great at that stat, and there's going to be people who are not great at that stat. Mm -hmm. So um, the highest die roll is the result for everyone, like the whole group. It's like, okay, our ship, you know, shot at them. Per great. Perfect. But everyone who fails the roll, it, it basically counts as the damage. So if you get a six minus roll, it's like, oh, Two people, you know, you succeeded, great, but oh, two people got a six minus, so that's two. That your 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 ship got shot twice, hit got hit twice, mark two damage. So it's like in this, what you have one roll. It's very also inspired by um, Wild Talents and the other mm -hmm. games that like for the one roll engine, the ore system. Yep. Um, where everybody rolls at the same time, which I love that that combat mechanic, and it just resolves really fast. You're like, okay, who's got the highest result? Okay. Oh, okay, you got a nine. That's good. Blah, blah, blah. Here's what happens on a nine. Oh, and we've got two six minuses. So, okay, that's two sets of damage. All right, next round. What do you want to do this time? Mm -hmm. So everyone gets to participate. Then it's they they narrate what they're going to do. Um, everybody gets to roll. So even if your character's hiding under the bed, like, okay, well, you know, here's what I'm doing. Or maybe your character's praying or things like that. That wouldn't always necessarily have, like, a, an actual move to go with them or something to roll with that. But you get to add to the narrative, and then your die roll still gets to add to the narrative as well. Yeah, I'm guessing. And I'm guessing that's part of the reason why each of the player um, playbooks has one section called ship customization. That's actually more for to make it feel like a home, because mm -hmm. uh, all these things, especially when you look at all these touchstones, they always have those little things that are like mm -hmm. unique to you know the the their particular ship. So, like, everyone has their own little room decorated in Serenity. You know, Anara's is beautiful and lavish, and that's very much inspiring. Like, one of the options for the civilian playbook is lavish accommodations. Mm -hmm. Is that which one of the three choices that the civilian can choose for their ship thing? Um, so some people have, uh, like, a garage where they can wrench on things, or a laboratory where they can, you know, do these things. And some people have... Uh, a simulator or a place where they you know can can get a drink mm -hmm. so it's it's more to make it unique and customized and feel like this is where they live 
Yeah, I can, I can cert, I can certainly get that. And it's all, it's. You brought, you brought up Jane earlier, and I'm reminded of his, of his quarters and the fact that he, <laughs> the 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 guy who's essentially the muscle of the crew has that has that hat. Yeah. Well, I'm not going to say anything bad about that hat. It's Mahi that made that hat. Exactly. Oh. Uh, but you know. You know, you t- you peel back you peel back one of the curtains there, and there's guns, guns, and more guns. <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, um. But I was I I was tempted to ask wh- which of the um, ship sheets would fit the Defiant, but I realized it'd probably be the light freighter. Maybe I I feel like it might also be a flag the flagship since it has even though it's smaller, like it's definitely. Um, like the top of the line, and 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 brand new. And I've often I've often described the freighter as not the freighter, um, the defined as spite in <laughs> in yes. um, ship form because yeah. if you look if you look at if you look at it really, it's a pair of guns strapped on an engine. Exactly. Yeah. And I believe the only reason they called it defined is because they couldn't call it Ben Cisco's motherfucking pimp hand. <laughs> Uh, okay, yeah, <laughs> oh. um, but yeah, I, I, yeah, I would, I would much more think that the Defiant is, is the, the flagship more, um, just for the options on there, like because the size isn't necessarily a thing, other than the Behemoth, which like the size of that is very much part of what gives the, that character to that ship. Mm-hmm. Um, the the thing about the the flagship is it's like new off the line. It's you know it's it maybe it has. Amazing, you know, it maybe it's hard to find parts for it because it's so new. Like the the different quirks and things that you can choose for it would be much more in line with the Defiant than the Freighter, which is like, hey, you're barely holding it together, and you can do, you know, things like that. Like it's not quite like duct taping it together, but that's like kind of the vibe sometimes for that book. I'm, I mean, some some are going to be more duct taped than others. I, I mean, the Galactica in that story was just was just almost going to be a museum <laughs> yeah it, it was remember they had to like remove like a bunch of the stuff mm-hmm. <laughs> but it, listen, I, I remember there's like some line about the gift shop or something i don't remember yeah, but, yeah. it was at the start of the story it was going to be de- it was going to be decommissioned because it was an old relic then mm-hmm. things went to shit and it got and that never happened and yeah. you have possibly the um the wor- the worst two pe- the worst two people you could I'd say the worst three people you could have at the f- at the front end of it you've got Adama who um is <laughs> who is not th- not the person I'd want to get on the bad side of at any point right I mean the pilot had him beating a Cylon to death with a flashlight mm-hmm. uh, of course you look back at his history and you learn that's that wasn't exactly an isolated case <laughs> no. You had you have Ty who um, I think he left his memory in the other bottle, mm-hmm. and you have Starbuck who um, is the is the first is one step removed from starting a Wild West shootout. So yes, which is per which whenever I GM that's perfect for me because I le- I I like to have as a framing device my party my the parties as. They they are members of the of the elite among the elite crews, but they are the island of misfit toys in that group, the mm-hmm. weirdos, the the um the guy the guys who are a few eggs short of a picnic in one form or another, the outcasts. Yeah. Uh, the guys who are really good at their job, they just have ver- they just have various quirks that that make them a royal pain to work with for anybody else. Mm-hmm. You know. And if it if it sounds like if it sounds like I'm cribbing notes from Inglorious Bastards at times, well, I can't, well, if you're gonna steal, steal from the best. Yeah. <laughs> but given that a lot of a lot of PBTA games are gonna be themed ar- themed around episodes in one form or another, uh, what sometimes a little bit more literal, like in something like Monster of the Week, but. Within the full book of Starscape, do you have plans on put on putting advice on how to set up missions or even putting in a, a random mission generator? There's definitely going to be 
more guidance. I, I work really hard in the GM sections. I think it's one of the most important parts of a game book, honestly. Because mm -hmm. um, no matter what you write in the rest of it, if the GM doesn't know how to capture the tone your game's going for, doesn't matter what you wrote in the rest of the book. <laughs> like, so that's one of the most pivotal pieces. I think also, uh, my day job, I'm a teacher. So there's like this, I, I feel like it's really important to be able to kind of set thing, set people up for success with it and like teach them step by step, like these are the things. Um, so we are going to have set adventures too, uh, like a set, uh, an adventure book that's written by me and some other people um, that people will be able to use to kind of model their own plans for it. Mm -hmm. um, as well, because I think that's something that's not in, not enough systems do. It's like they give you adventures to run, or they expect you to do it on your own. There's not a lot of like in between hand holding. Like here's a framework for a a, a a successful adventure. Here's what you should do. Or they sell it as like a separate book. It's like oh okay here here's a guide that you can spend more money to get, and you're like oh, okay but I already bought your game. Why can't I play your game without buying another thing? Or you know. in worst case scenarios, you have what what I like to call swim, damn it. Yeah, Basically. yeah, they just toss you in and good luck. Yeah, also also known as um, French fighting planes in the in World War One because <laughs> somebody somebody thought you know the, you know putting a putting a machine gun behind the propeller is not a good idea. Yeah, and the French went Oof. all right, fine. We'll put a metal plate next to it. Ugh. The early days of aviation were weird. <laughs> yeah. Or, oh, I don't remember what, uh, I don't remember what style plane it was, but, uh, the ones where the escape hatch was in front of the propellers, the side propellers on both wings. Yeah. So you had to, yeah, so to, if, if it, the plane was going down, they had to turn off the engines and wait till the propellers stopped spinning so they wouldn't be, like, you know, cut, cut in a million tiny pieces. Mm hmm spliced and diced while they were trying to, you know, use their parachutes. Yeah. You've... Uh, and whenever it comes to this sort of interstellar science fiction, there is one elephant in the room that um, ha that has to be addressed in one form or another, and that is um, FTL. Is this one of those things that the table would determine how FTL would work in their campaign, or... Do you have certain leanings? Uh, yeah, there's options depending on which one of the, the ships you pick. Each ship has a couple different options that the group can choose from. So you can do jump gates, which it tends to be my favorite. I love those. As a GM, that's just so easy to use because it's like they're slow as heck like in the system or pretty slow in the system. It's like, can you make it to the jump gate? Um, or, oh no, the jump gate's down! Like, there's so many ways to, like, use those as a, as, like, a storyteller. Um, but you can also, on some of them, choose, uh, like, FTL drives. Mm -hmm. Um, but there's also kind of a, a secondary thing with that. Like, it's, it's really fast, but the power source is kind of dangerous. Like, the warp drives. It's like, oh, this is great while well, it's working, and then if it's not working, it might kill us all. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, so it's like having that, that benefit, but also that other side of the coin that comes with it. Um, is really important, I think, with all games, but specifically with um, sci-fi stuff, because it's so easy just to be like and hand wave. Oh, technology has fixed all these things, and you're just like, yeah. But then that's that's what's the point of telling stories if everything's perfect? It's mm -hmm. got it's got to have like that secondary piece. Yeah, I uh, the the approach that I've often taken as a comprom is kind of a middle point between warp travel and jump gates. Mm -hmm. The approach I've taken is the safest way to go mm -hmm. is jump gates, which mm -hmm. are at which are at specific points and kind of and are kind of treated like port towns. Yeah. Or or um tr or trading posts from from like two hundred years ago. Mm -hmm. Now, if you want if you want to do a if you want to do a wild jump, you can grab a cushion because this is where the butt comes in. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You in in doing a wild jump, you may you you there may be some asterisk put on your destination. Yeah. Maybe you'll get there exactly when you need to. Maybe you'll get there in the past. Maybe in the future. Maybe you'll mm -hmm. get to some. Maybe you'll end up going to some place you completely didn't intend on doing. Mm-hmm. Um. 
and I had used that as an as an inroad to bring in pirates. Yeah. Because that's it's a perfect excuse for me to have pirates just show up out of nowhere if I feel the story's going too slow. Yeah. Space pirates are always a great go-to. Everything's better with pirates. <laughs> yes, 100%. <laughs> and it's it's kind of my own spin on the Just Add Ninjas um, line that Robin Laws had with Feng Shui. Is the story <laughs> going too slow? Add ninjas. Yeah. Uh, if it, especially, especially since in, do, in doing the... There's always this wild. There's always been this wild west attitude when it comes to the space opera in one form or another. Sometimes mm -hmm. more intentional than others. So having it having it where it where um there's a lot of open space out there, but a lot of danger mm -hmm. is very much in keeping with that. Even if, absolutely. Even if you're not doing a direct western like say Firefly was, and even even then Firefly did had um had the implicit threat of of a threat of a threat beyond in the dark between stars in the form of the reapers. Yeah. And yeah, they only showed up twice in the sh in the show, but you don't need to have them show up that often. Right. The, 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 there's like a constant omnipresence there with hmm. them because you know the kid can show up at any time. Yeah. They could show up at um, any time. They they are hard, they are hard to predict and you know when they've been somewhere. Yeah. Now, one of the things that was really important to me in Starscape is that we didn't just skip over the living part mm -hmm. of being in the ship. Um, so we actually have, there's like a journey mechanic that's very much inspired by the One Ring Second Edition that Free League did, which mm -hmm. I just adored. Um, and they have a system where it's like a mix of like charts and tables, but also like characters get some choice in that. Um, so I have a mechanic for that that's not in the quick start of Starscape, but it's going to be in the full version of it. So I actually don't want things to be hand waved by like FTL where you're like, oh, OK, and you leave and you go. So it's like you have to actually figure out, OK, even at fashion like travel, it takes a while to get places because you're talking about such vast distances. So it's like, OK, if you're going to spend three days, let's go ahead and we're going to use the journey mechanic. And it creates um, interactions between the player characters. Sometimes it's stuff like, okay, you're attacked, or there's an asteroid, or whatever it is. But most of the time, it's um, smaller things. Like, so-and-so, uh, or someone on the crew comes and asks you for advice. You know, and you create those scenes with the characters, uh, e with each other, um, on, those, on those, those flights. Or you spend time, you know, doing something that you enjoy. What is it this time? You know, things like that. Maybe it's, you know, watching TV, whatever it is. Fl knitting, who knows? Like, if it was Cisco, it would be like, okay, I'm going to cook some gumbo. Um, but, you know, all those little details, like Data having a cat, Cisco loving to cook, all these little things are are only available when people spend time that's not necessarily under pressure. Those are the things people go back to. And if you talk to people who do, um, like, long haul, like, like sailing, this is also what they do as well. Um, those moments in between where it's just kind of like waiting to get there. And I think those are really important to focus on. So I actually made, well, if FTL is an option, like you can't just, like it specifically tells you not to just hand wave that time, that that's really important character development time. Mm -hmm. And so, and that, yeah, that's why also why a lot of the playbooks don't have FTL as an option. So like if you should take the living being, you know, that maybe it swims through, you know, the, the ether of space or whatever you have it do. There's, I forget what the options are there, but um, there's also like, um, floating on galactic ley lines, or like I mentioned earlier, the sailing, like the sailing, um, the solar winds, or whatever it is. Uh, like all of those things. I don't know. I just love like the vision and the narrative uh, of them, and also that it gives you time to just be, you know, uh, beings with each other, people with each other. Yeah, and um, we've had. Sailors would pass the time with things like shanties. What's st what's stopping an equivalent in a in a science fiction setting? Exactly. I mean, we don't have to like coordinate our rope pulling for shanties. That was the biggest point for shanties. But uh, like, there's definitely music is definitely a part of, of Starscape, uh, partially because I sing a lot of shanties. <laughs> yeah. 
And I'll start, I I don't sing as many shanties, but I do love drinking songs. Ah, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, and and on occasion getting thrown out of the worst Irish tenor contest. <laughs> Sometimes more literally than others. <laughs> but with that with that said, um, uh, what would you be shooting for as far as a page count for Starscape? Um, I've got, uh, around, I have my first draft, it's, it's not quite done, and it's about 120, like, typed pages, but, like, full-on, like, like, Google Doc pages, so I haven't broken that down into what it would be on a 6x9, like, printed page yet, so I'm, I'm, I'm gonna aim for between 200 and 250, um, it might end up being a little bit more, a little bit less than that, but somewhere in that range. A lot of it will depend on um, the alpha readers who go through the, the the final document first, and then the editing process. Yeah, I can I can certainly get that. And as far as a release window, what would you be shooting for on that front? Not um, a I hope date, per se, yeah. just a ballpark. Um, I it now the thing is, is it takes um, anywhere between four to six months at this point to actually get something printed. So I'm hoping to have the book completed, laid out, you know, all proofread, the whole thing done um, by June of 2025 um, at the, hopefully the latest. And then I'll order the books. And so they might actually be delivered for people who, like the PDFs will be delivered to people when they're done, probably next summer and, or maybe a little bit sooner than that. And then Whenever the books are in, so anywhere between like June, July, August, September, like October and like December 2025. Hmm. So, yeah, I can I can certainly get that. Yeah, it takes it takes so long, and people are just like, and especially like we're we're having. I specifically like this is not my first Kickstarter. I've done a bunch before, helped with other people's before. Um, I'm very active in multiple like game manufacturing communities. Um, it just it, everything takes longer than you expect it to. Um, I, my first game, Decima, is a card-based game. I ordered those cards in October. Uh, no, sorry, November. Like it was like November third or something when I actually placed the order and paid for them. And they are on a ship ne- right now. <laughs> it's coming to the United States. It takes so long sometimes. Hmm. Uh, and it, it's like once it gets on the ship, it's another month, month and a half to get here. Like there's just so many little things that. That takes so much longer than you expect. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that, that's, wh- that's why I go for a ballpark whenever I bring this kind of thing up, because I know things yeah. can happen. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So my goal uh, is, like, fall, like, my, my deadline, like, oh, absolutely, before the end of 2025. Mm-hmm. Well, I will certainly look forward to seeing how it develops. But with that said... I do want to sincerely thank you for taking the time out of your schedule to come all the way to my temple and enjoy the madness that happens around here. Yeah, my pleasure. It's been lovely. And really, I love how you decorate it. Mm -hmm. And anytime you see fit to return, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. (laughs) Slasha. And... Of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. And there'll be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty, everybody!